Hey there, so here in front of me in this box, we have a brand new system from GMK Tech. It is their new Nook Box K8. This is their 2024 release that's running on the AMD Ryzen 7 8845HS. Now don't let the 8000 on that chip fool you. That's actually just a re-release of the 7840HS. The only major difference really between the two chips is the fact that the NPU, which is just the AI engine in the chip, actually got bumped up in terms of performance. But for you, that probably doesn't matter. Now normally, that would make this an uninteresting system, but considering the fact that the K4 that I tested before actually had issues with the RAM overheating, I'm very curious to see how this new system actually handles things. One thing I'm also very interested to see is just how big the power supply is. And uh, okay, yeah, it's 120 watts. That's actually really nice. Another problem that GMK Tech has had before is that they have had their systems run at some relatively low TDPs in comparison to their competition, while also not exactly being that competitive in terms of noise. Now, in terms of the overall design of the system, I actually really, really like it. It's, uh, it's hard for me to capture with my camera just what this looks like it's a very very silver design but unfortunately it is all plastic though i am happy to see that, that they have kept the green button i'm a huge fan of the color of green that gmk tech uses it's one of my favorite shades of green all around though the construction of the system is fine enough and the best part is that it has these big rubber feet here that you don't have to destroy to get into the system because all you have to really do is pop off the top of course once you're in there you will see the shroud that is underneath but you can just unscrew it to get in there we're not going to be doing that right now we might take a look at that in another video in terms of io it's a standard configuration here we do have two 2.5 gigabit NICs. we do have the hdmi and i'm glad to see that we do have a display port the only seeing one high speed usb at the back is disappointing two of them in the front and we only get one usb type c not very competitive io but for the most part it is passable Certainly not class leading, but it is not really falling that far behind its peers either. This configuration does end up coming with, of course, the 8845HS, but it does come also with 32 gigabytes of RAM, and we have a 2 terabyte NVMe Gen 4 SSD. All in all, a pretty solid configuration, especially considering that GMK Tech right now is selling this configuration for around 700 US dollars. If you compare that to the bare bone price and add in the cost of 32 gigabytes of RAM and a two terabyte SSD, it's actually pretty fairly priced. You're not really getting upsold anything here or, or anything, at least at, as of pricing right now, it's pretty competitive. Now, as I mentioned before, the 8845 HS is just a re release of the 7840HS from last year. It is just the NPU that got an update, and because of that, you really shouldn't expect anything that different here in comparison to any other system. And in fact, at this point, TDP is really going to be the deciding factor of overall performance, because as we've seen with these higher end APUs, the TDP actually greatly starts to affect the level of performance that you can get out of these, especially when we're talking about CPU workloads. Loads. Gaming and stuff like that do benefit from the TDP increase, but it has a far more dramatic drop off in terms of benefit. And we're going to see that in some of the testing here. Now, booting into the desktop for the first time, the system was actually configured to set up a local file so you don't have to log into your Microsoft account. Really, really nice to see. I love it when manufacturers actually do that. Taking a look at the pre-installed applications, though, there are some annoyances. I've seen some OEMs do this where they come with the essentially installed taller for every single language version of Microsoft 365 from pretty much every region. And the same applies for OneNote. And it ends up being kind of really annoying to get rid of. You should just nuke the install yourself. But besides that, there is no pre-installed software from the manufacturer or anything like that. So it's pretty clean.
Now the BIOS itself is very, very bare bones. One thing I would do is I would change the amount of allocated VRAM to the iGPU to at least four gigabytes. If you want to avoid ever getting any kind of messages about VRAM limits in any game, I would set it all the way up to eight. The rest of the BIOS itself is really bare bones, though there is at least a power limit selection. It comes down to three different presets, with the balance preset being what it defaults to, and the balance preset actually has a default TDP of 54 watts there's a quiet preset of 35 watts and a performance of 65 watts now this is a little misleading if we try out the performance preset and we jump over to something like cinebench immediately we start to see that if we let cinebench run for a few minutes we get to the point of thermal throttling the system seems to have a hard limit of 90 degrees celsius where at that point it really just starts to pull back the TDP and it pretty much effectively ends up dropping down the overall TDP down to the level of the balance preset anyway so there's really no reason to use the performance preset you will never be able to use those 65 watts because the system really can't handle that so it's best to just use the balance preset or the quiet preset and we'll take a look at the quiet preset more in depth in another video but I will show you what that did to the overall performance the quiet preset said actually ended up being pretty impressive to me because after running it on here the result that i ended up getting was definitely noticeably lower than what we got when we used the balance and the performance preset with the balance and performance preset effectively being the same because there was no real difference due to the fact that the performance preset was of course you know dropping down to the balance preset level but the thing that impressed me the most was the fact that at the 35 watt tdp the system was one noticeably quieter because this thing was absolutely screeching at the balance and the performance preset when fully loaded but what i really was mostly impressed by was the fact that it ended up giving us a better result than the 8600g now the 8600g is a ryzen 5 based apu also based on zen 4 but it's a desktop apu and it has a noticeably higher tdp in the testing that i did with it it was was effectively averaging a TDP of around 110 watts, which means that at the wall, it was actually measuring at using around 150 watts. And even with a higher TDP, one that is effectively double what this Ryzen 7 has, it's not able to close the gap. And I think that that's the biggest advantage that AMD has with their APUs is just how insanely efficient they are when you are within that efficiency curve, where at 30 35 watts we're almost using half as much wattage as the highest preset but we're not getting half of the performance we pretty much drop our power usage in half to lose 12 percent on our multi-core performance score and the single core performance stayed exactly the same and i think that this is one of the strongest things about this chip here because measured at the wall at the 35 watt tdp i was using about 58 watts fully loaded during Cinebench in comparison to using the balance preset, which was using around 86. And again, for only a 12% drop in the overall performance. And that's in a fully loaded situation. Things are going to be vastly different if we're only going to be pushing a few cores at a time because the single core performance stays exactly the same. What that effectively means is that you could grab three of these little systems and set up a cluster of them in something like Proxmox and Wendell at level one text has done great videos talking about this before but you could essentially end up with 24 cores spread out across three nodes each of them having 32 gigabytes and each of them having a two terabyte SSD all of this with dual 2.5 gigabit NICs and all of that just consuming from the wall not even 300 watts that is a three node high availability cluster with insanely good specs, not even using 300 watts. 
That's pretty insane levels of performance and flexibility that you get out of something like this. Now for the gaming testing, I of course stuck with the balance preset because as we saw, the high performance was not going to do nothing for us at all. Luckily enough with the balance preset, we do get some fantastic levels of performance and also we don't really get into some high temperatures at all, though the system is making some noticeable amounts of noise. Not the loudest system that I've heard at all, but in comparison to systems like the B-Link Sir 6 Max, the Sir 7, and the UM780 XTX, this is pretty distractingly loud. Luckily enough for that noise, you are getting a very, very cool system, so in general, you're never going to really get to the point of thermal throttling while gaming. This was a really great result out of Hell Divers. I had a great time playing, and the fact that we could actually use FSR at a setting that was higher than performance was nice, though balance still doesn't really look amazing. It's going to be great once we get to the point where we have APUs that will let us use FSR at quality or ultra quality more consistently because at those settings it's a lot more passable than having to use performance or even balance. Still for how enjoyable this game is I would pretty much put up with these settings if it meant I got to play. Now another game that I wanted to take a look at on here was Guardians of the Galaxy running with the lowest in-game graphics settings but using FSR at the quality preset or rather the ultra quality preset and this is the kinds of settings that I would like to be able to use because even though it is FSR 1.0 FSR 1.0 is a lot more easy to stomach at these higher settings even though it still does make a noticeable impact in the visual quality it's a lot less distracting like this and luckily enough the game actually performs really really well and this really impressed me this is far beyond what I'm used to seeing out of mini PCs in general and it does mean that we might just be a generation away from a lot of these titles being far more usable with FSR where we can actually get away with just quality instead of having to use performance where the visuals really take a nosedive. Tiny Tino's Wonderland is another perfect example where here we were actually able to use the medium graphics settings and FSR at quality and we still get a really great result here overall and again the temperatures are looking fantastic it is a really enjoyable experience and we don't have to sacrifice everything just to be able to get good performance because now that we're at the medium graphic settings we get a lot of the benefits of turning things up going past here from going to the high setting or even the ultra setting the gains are a lot less noticeable versus going from medium down to the very low graphic setting so this is really the ideal spot and i'm glad that we're actually able to hit that here using f FSR at a setting that isn't going to be disastrous. And speaking of a disaster, I did decide to load into CS2 and actually try out the performance on here. We are running this at the lowest in-game graphic settings, though I did set the textures to the highest. And instead of doing the usual bot match, I figured I might as well load into a death match so that we don't have to actually process the bots since apparently that could actually affect the performance unfortunately that meant that i was getting absolutely slaughtered while trying to play on here but luckily i was being slaughtered at a buttery smooth fps look at those frame times as i die it's beautiful this is about as ideal as it gets if you're going to be gunned down by someone significantly better than you you want it to happen at an fps that is this high this smooth and this crisp overall it's a great experience if you're the kind of person that actually plays this game if you can't tell i don't really play cs at all but it's nice to see that the update to cs2 didn't completely break performance on a chip like this where we don't have a full dedicated graphics card but we do have effectively the equivalent of a low-end dedicated graphics card built into this chip and with that being the case this is a really impressive result of course there is going to be a massive video dedicated to the gaming performance on this specific chip so stay tuned for that so how do I feel so far about the GMK Tech K8? Well, there's a lot of aspects of it that are unremarkable. For the most part, it tends to stay in line with its rest of its peers and doesn't really do anything to stand out in comparison to everything else in the mini P market. The easily accessible and non-destructive way of getting to all of the components inside that you could upgrade is very nice. The inclusion of a second M.2 slot is also really nice, but for the hardware that's in here, 
here, that's kind of in line with what the rest of the competition has been doing since last year. And considering that it's a new chip that isn't really all that new, aside for a component that most of the customers for this system will never use, it's a tough sell on that part. But it is launching at a very competitive price price especially for the configurations that it comes with with the lowest tier being essentially bare bones you can get it with a one terabyte configuration with 32 gigabytes of ram or you can get a two terabyte configuration with 32 gigabytes of ram and at the prices that these are at with current prices of ssds on the market as well as ram it's actually not a bad price at all really though the thing that i liked the most about this system is its potential as a way to set up a very very powerful very very cost effective in terms of power usage cluster not going to be cheap these computers themselves are not cheap individually right now but depending on where you live the power savings that you could get for using something like this could be pretty insane in the united states it might not make that much sense to go for something that is uber efficient but in many european countries and really throughout most of the world the cost of electricity is just significantly higher to the point where it makes sense that maybe you want to be conscious about how much power you're going to be using on a system that's going to be running 24 7 in your house and the main benefits of using something like this is really the fact that you get those eight zen 4 cores that are going to be very very high performing if you set this to 35 watts the system is going to be very very quiet but it's still going to perform very very well again you saw we only lost 12 percent on the multi-core but we were essentially using half the amount of wattage so it's still going to be top tier performance we get an igpu that is actually very effective while also having av1 decoding we get of course the 32 gigabytes of ram that can be expanded all the way up to 96 gigabytes if you want to if you're considering that there is the bare bones option and in theory you can go all the way up to 16 terabytes of ssd storage but realistically you're going to cap out at more like eight and again all of this on a system that is going to be using at a maximum of less than 60 watts from the wall and what's nice about using a zen based configuration as opposed to an intel one is the fact that you don't have to deal with multiple different types of cores there is no e cores or p cores in this situation we're all p cores and craft computing did do a great video where he showed how proxmox actually works relatively well and surprisingly so with a mix of p and e cores and it can actually handle that really really well but at the end of the day that is still a situation where you're going to have only so many cores that are going to be high performance performance and the rest are going to be very very slow by comparison and not be multi-threaded in this situation it's eight full p cores all of them with smt so you end up with 16 threads so 16 threads on one node you can get three of these and end up with some very high performance clusters that are going to be beating out a lot of people out there where if you go on reddit you'll see so many people in the home lab subreddit or the home server subreddit that have these xeon systems that are like a decade old or like eight years old that have great multi-core performance but are just guzzling down power like it's nothing and with three of these you're going to be beating out all of those systems while more than likely not even using as much power as just one of those running at full load would end up consuming and there's a lot of benefit to that not to mention the size not to mention the noise because even at its loudest this system is still not going to be as loud as a full dedicated decommissioned server so for home labbers specifically i think that these are really interesting and really really great but if you're looking for gaming and stuff like that it's not a bad option but really it's a lot more competitive in terms of just pricing around and i think that a lot of last year's models are going to seem a lot more attractive considering the fact that the current amd offering is just a refresh so it's not a bad deal at all especially at current price points and i think that at the current 700 dollars price point for the 32 gigabytes and two terabyte ssd actually a pretty solid deal and the bare bones itself is actually looking pretty well priced right now
And for you early people that have been messing around with using stable diffusion and stuff like that on these NPUs in these early days, it probably will be nice to see a bump in the performance on here, though I don't think that it's going to be substantial enough that if you're on a last year's model, you'd think of upgrading. It's just not a big jump at all, and it's still way too early on for something like that. But anyways, check out the system down below in the links, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.